Thank you. Good afternoon. Let's try it one more time. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. This is the first time we've been in this room together for a long time. I expect some enthusiasm here. Please. Thank you. I'm Cassandra Pai. I am a president of Lucas Public Affairs, and I am pleased to welcome you on behalf of PPIC's Board of Directors to the first event of PPIC's 2023 speaker series on California future, California's future, I'm sorry. And again, the first time we've been, been in the room for about three years. So we're delighted to present this program today featuring Tony Atkins, President Pro Tem of the California State Senate, Brian Jones, please. <laughs> Brian, Jones, Brian Jones, State Senate Minority Leader, thank you. Before we begin, a couple of housekeeping items to mention. As a public charity, PPIC does not take or support positions on any ballot measure or legislation, nor does it support, endorse, or oppose any political parties or candidates for public office. Really important part of the mission to all of us. We would like to thank the sponsors of PPIC's 2023 series on California's future. Their support makes it possible for these events to be free and available to all of you. These organizations are listed on the screen and on our website. Please do me a favor and just give a round of applause to those who've been supportive of our efforts. Thank you. The series is also funded by PPIC's Donor Circle and the PPIC Corporate Circle, groups of individuals and organizations that provide generous support to PPIC. Please consider joining PPIC as a sponsor or a donor, and there is more information on both located on our website. There will be time during today's program for audience questions. State your name, state your organization before asking your question. For those of you joining us virtually, and welcome to all of you as well, please send an email to ppiceventquestions at gmail.com, ppiceventquestions at gmail.com. Also, in, in, be sure to include your name and organization along with your question. PPIC staff will monitor these questions and will incorporate them as much as we can. Lastly, and I will remember to do this when I get to my seat, silence your cell phones. Thank you. And now on to the program. I have been waiting for this moment for a while. I am really, really pleased, honored, and a little bit of everything else to introduce today's moderator. Tani Cantil Sakayui joined PPIC as president and CEO, effective January 1st this year, and we are more than thrilled to have her on board. Looking forward to this conversation. Welcome to all of you. What a pleasure it is to break bread together and to hear from these, these astounding leaders of California. I thought I would start today first with bios. I'll be brief because you can find more extensive biographical material about these two leaders at your table and online. But first, let me introduce to you the, for a person like both who need very little introduction, but I can't help myself. Uh, Senate President Pro Tempore, Tony G. Atkins. Senator Atkins was born and raised in Southwestern Virginia. Uh, she moved to San Diego after college and became involved in local government, including serving as the interim mayor of San Diego during a very challenging period. Before the Senate, she was elected to the assembly where she was elected by her colleagues as the assembly speaker. She was the first lesbian to hold that position. In 2016, she was elected to the Senate. And one year later, again, by her peers and colleagues, was selected as the Senate President Pro Tempore. She is the first woman and first San Diegan to hold that position. Uh, she also focuses, as you know, 
on various subject matters, including affordable housing, the environment, healthcare, veterans, women, the LGBTQ community, and climate change. Thank you. Welcome, Senator Atkins. Senate Republican leader, Senator Brian W. Jones, was born on a military base in Austin, Texas. When he was 10 years old, he moved also to San Diego. After college, he was in local government as a Santee City Council member. Before the Senate, Senator Jones was elected twice to the assembly for two different districts. And in 2018, he was elected to the Senate, again twice, for different districts. And on the first day of the new session in December 2022, he was elected by his peers and colleagues as the Senate Republican leader. In the Senate, Senator focuses on homelessness, public safety, lowering the cost of living, and removing barriers for business and Californians. Thank you and welcome, you. Senator. Because this question was first shared with both, we'll start with Senator Atkins to answer this question. What are one or two of the biggest issues facing California that the governor and the legislature must take action on in 2023? Well, thank you. Is that working? Great. Uh, Tani, thank you for having us today, and certainly PPIC, I was really looking forward to this, and Brian and I have worked together for actually decades. Uh, before we got to Sacramento. Um, on the question, I would say overriding everything is obviously the economic outlook, the fiscal situation in the country, and thereby what affects our state. Uh, we have to be mindful of that. Uh, but having said that, we have to look at the impacts of climate change because the impacts of climate change right now have everything to do with our uh, accessibility of water, uh, the cost of energy, wildfires, which we have been working together on for a number of years already. Um, obviously, uh, recent issues with floods. We've, we've got to focus on this, and what's great about it is we've uh, put a great deal of resources towards that that are not expended, so we need to be mindful of how we move forward and use those resources to impact all of those areas. Huge issue, I'm just gonna throw them all under climate change because then it encompasses every sort of big issue that we're dealing with. Second, uh, I have a long history of uh, really working hard at the local level, brought it to the state on housing, housing affordability, uh, housing production, and uh, you might as well extend and say the fact that we have uh, the homelessness situation that we have throughout the state has a lot to do with access to affordable housing as a foundation. Now, there's lots of other issues. There's behavioral health, there's um, addiction, there's a, a number of issues, uh, including the cost of living, et cetera, but uh, housing as a key issue uh, and homelessness. And uh, both Brian and I come out of local government, so when a reporter or someone asks us, what are your top priorities? That's really hard because everything is important, but I'm just gonna stop with those three things, fiscal responsibility, climate change and everything that falls under that, and housing and homelessness. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Atkins. Senator Jones, same question. Well, I, I agree with uh, everything that the pro tem said, and I would summarize it into the four categories, actually, rather than two. Uh, homelessness and, and the crime rate in California, th those kind of actually go together. Uh, cost of living and education in California. As I was running for office back in the fall, and meeting with constituents and knocking on doors and, and hearing from people, those are the top four things that they're uh, concerned about. And what the pro tem mentioned also with the, regarding the climate change issues that California is facing right now, we've got uh, unbelievable amounts of water coming out of the sky right now that we need to capture and hold for the years that we know we're gonna have drought and we know we're gonna have drought and then wildfires continuing to work with wildfires. And I've worked with Senator McGuire on that issue extensively over the last two years and look forward to continuing to do that. Thank you, Senator Jones. All those subjects resonate with all of us. And so I'm going to turn to the question that um, sort of drives all of that, and that's the budget. So I have two questions on the California budget. We know there's a sizable projected shortfall, 
And that's a shift, as you know, from recent years. So the first question uh, to you, Senator Jones, is what is the best way to navigate this new budget reality? And uh, besides the best way, what are your top budget priorities this year? Thank you. Well, I, first of all, the Republican caucus agrees with the governor that we should not be dipping into the reserves. Uh, we're not quite at that point yet. We feel like that maybe even next year might not be as good as this year. And so we need those reserves to be available uh, for future years if we do go into a full recession. Uh, you know, our budget priorities are gonna be focused on those four issues that I talked about. Uh, keeping our communities safe, uh, dealing with our crime rate in California, dealing with the homeless issue, and dealing with the cost of living in California, and hopefully helping uh, municipalities streamline CEQA and streamline other issues to get more homes built in California. Thank you. Um, Senator Atkins. Thank you. Um, well, we've solved one problem already. Uh, I agree with uh, Senator Jones that we have to protect our reserves. And I think the governor feels that way. We feel that way. It took a decade. Uh, when Brian and I came into office as assembly members, we had a $26 billion deficit. A decade of prudent, um, really hard work under former Governor Jerry Brown, the legislature, the current governor, uh, we have built those reserves back. We actually have a rainy day fund, thanks to the voters. Uh, so this was a California community effort to put ourselves in the position to actually have a real reserve. We have a health care reserve, a Prop 98 reserve, a regular reserve, a rainy day fund. Uh, this is hard work. It took a decade. Um, the focus, uh, I really believe, out of my Senate Democratic Caucus is to protect the progress that we have made over the last decade. Uh, services for vulnerable Californians, whether we're talking issues around homelessness, mental health issues, absolutely the highest budgets ever for education, and I agree with my colleague, it's a huge issue for, uh, for our constituents throughout the state, education. But uh, also, um, how we look at all of the money that has been expended over the last two years, it's not all spent. You cannot spend that amount of money in one year. You have to have a plan uh, on what needs to be done. That has been the uh, focus of our policy committee work. It's been the focus of our budget oversight committee uh, and, and through the budget process to look at new programs, to look at enhancing existing programs. And now we need to make sure and uh, protect the progress but make sure those monies are being ex expended in the best way possible given our limits. And so that's gonna be our priority even as we look at all of the issues that both Brian and I have already mentioned, from public safety to education to healthcare, uh, obviously workforce issues. Uh, we have a huge shortage uh, in terms of a number of categories, healthcare, um, teachers, uh, so we've got a lot of work ahead of us, but I think our focus needs to be on implementing, uh, protecting the progress, and being mindful of our fiscal situation. Thank you, Senator Atkins. And I think that's very reassuring. And we all remember the wise efforts made by the legislature in building the surplus and the, I think, the fiscal and frugal decisions that were made that put us in a position today. So thank you. I'm going to uh, tell you that yesterday, marked three years since California's first confirmed case of COVID. Uh, this is to you, Senator Atkins. Tell us about your experience being a policymaker, a leader during the COVID crisis, and what lessons uh, have you taken away from these past three years? That's a simple question. Um, <laughs> I, I have learned that as a legislative body that we actually can be flexible. We can adjust to the realities of a crisis. And you know, we hear all these wonderful sayings in our lives and, and they come from somewhere. There's nothing like a good crisis to reevaluate what's important to us, how to do things differently. And um, I just appreciate my colleagues, the Republicans and the Democrats, the assembly, the governor, uh, all of you, uh, the folks that are stakeholders that uh, work in the capital community, because we really had to figure out how to do the people's business, follow the Constitution, something I know you uh, care a great deal about, and, and still do our jobs. Uh, and, you know, I remember 
uh, we allocated a billion dollars uh, with some parameters to support schools and healthcare and workers, and then we all had to go home and figure out how we were gonna work on the ground in our communities. So the lessons I take away is, I know that we can do things uh, differently. I know that um, we can manage uh, crises. I know that we did an incredible job in California, but it took all of us working together. And uh, on a more personal side, I learned the value of friends and family in a way that I think, you know, we get busy in our everyday lives and we, we're in the career, we're doing the work, we love it. Um, and then we realize how delicate and uh, valuable life is as it relates to our, our families and our friends. I lost an uncle, I lost a dear, dear friend um, and saw numerous other people experience loss. And I think that made me a different person as I approach legislation and the work that we do. And it reminded me, um, I always say it's really important to listen, but listening actively and really hearing uh, and noticing the change, the, the, the environmental change, the attitude, the energy change that affected all of us, particularly our kids. Thank you for that uh, professional and very personal response, Senator Atkins, and uh, our condolences on the loss to your family members. Um, Senator Jones, same question. What are your experience about being a policymaker during COVID and your takeaway lessons? Well, I, I came at this uh, from the very beginning with a little bit more of a libertarian attitude in, I was concerned about government overreacting from the beginning. And I even, I wrote an op-ed that the Union Tribune uh, published in April of uh, 2020 that kind of outlined some of those concerns. Some of my concerns uh, became real and, and some of them didn't. I would, you know, if I were to do things different than the way they were done, and obviously this is Monday morning quarterbacking, right? So that's easy to do. But from the beginning, I thought that the government was, was going, and all across the country, not just California government, not just our local counties, but across the, the country, we're going just a little bit too far in um, telling us how to respond to this uh, pandemic. I, my preference would have been for the government to give us the information, give us suggestions on, on what to do, and then us to make those decisions. I think one of the, the saddest things that happened, and uh, Tony alluded to it a little bit, is the pressure and tension that it put on families. And so I would, and then look, it happened in my family on uh, debates and disagreements on different aspects of what was going on in our, in our country, in our globe at that point in time. As we're unwinding and, and moving away from the pandemic and recovering from it, the governor has announced he's gonna lift the, the executive orders next month. Uh, I, I, I think there's general agreement that we're safely coming out of this now. Uh, obviously, there's still concerns, but I would hope that all of us, if we had those tensions with our family members, would try to find a way to go back to those family members and initiate the conversation of reconciliation. I would hate for our country to have this permanent impact uh, on a personal level in our families uh, and, and have that negative impact going forward uh, for years and or decades. So that would be my encouragement to everybody in this room. We're doing it in our family and uh, hopefully get to the point where families can be happy together again. Thank you, thank you, Senator Jones. And I think you did put your finger on the pulse of the fact that there were different approaches and different debates about COVID and it was evolving at all times. So thank you. And thank you for the advice about the healing process that you've referred to. Um, this is uh, still on COVID, but it's going to pertain to higher education. Um, and so, or actually K-12 education. So this is to you, Senator Jones. Uh, you've described uh, how COVID has had and, and for some continues to have a profound impact on all aspects of our lives. On top of the mind for many and maybe many here is K-12 education in California. What steps should be uh, taken by the legislature <clears throat> to help students, to help students make up for any educational ground lost during the pandemic? Well, I think you know families are going to have to take some responsibility for this with their children, and and parents are going to have to be diligent in 
uh, filling in those gaps that we, we can't expect our teachers with 20 to 30 students in their classrooms every day to be able to, to give every single student the individual attention that they need. So as parents, we're gonna have to step in and fill that gap a little bit and help our children uh, catch up and, and be, uh, regain what they've lost. Uh, and Tony alluded to it earlier, in the budget process, we're gonna be talking about budgeting for education. And we do have some of the highest uh, budgets for education right now that the state of California has ever had and some of the highest budgets in the country. You know, I'll be advocating that that budget is uh, doled out uh, equally, fairly, between uh, traditional public schools, charter schools, and then what we can do to uplift, uh, you know, if there's things that we can do to uplift private schools and homeschooling as well. I think that parents in California are, are ready for a school choice. They want to be responsible for their kids' education, and we need to help them in that direction. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Atkins. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I don't know that you have the ability to give back two or three years to a kid, uh, whether they're in uh, elementary school, middle school, high school, college. I've spent a lot of time in recent days uh, certainly during COVID, but talking to friends and neighbors about uh, what was the experience of your family. I don't have children at home right now, um, but I, I, the stories really resonate with me in terms of parents who had to um, really step in and um, oversee kids on Zoom uh, taking classes. And I, you know, and it, it's it's sort of funny, but not when people say I was really good on the reading, but not so good on the math. And then we saw the studies come out that prove that. Um, I, and, and I do think you're right. Um, our community, uh, I, I think we were told in society we needed to take a, a little bit of a step back. And it is gonna take time and ability to really support kids at every level into uh, elementary, well, preschool, uh, elementary school, middle school, high school, and college. Uh, and we have to adjust and have a different way of thinking about how to continue on. And the money that we put into education, the learning loss, uh, the money that we put into organizations that support our um, families in schools before and after school, all of those things are really important. But I think we have to give, we have to really give voice to the fact that you don't make up three years quickly and that we need to be able to provide those supports, including mental health services and those kinds of things that are gonna help us all get back on track uh, and realize that you know, it's gonna take some time. We are really, I try to tell my young, younger uh, nephews and, and the kids I know in my life, you are only in competition with yourself. Let's pick up from here. You don't need to be in competition with anybody else. So we really have to have um, a perspective on this that is humanistic that is uh, taking into account mental health. And at the same time, there are dollars that we have put towards this. We need to evaluate how have we done, how are we doing it, and what do we continue to need to do along those lines to provide that support to um, schools and adjacent uh, organizations that are really trying to help people get back on track and people go back to work. I mean, we have lots of issues we're gonna have to talk about about remote work, some businesses do it differently, government, you know, people expect to see us in government present directly. So I think we've got lots more conversations to have, but um, let's use the resources we've already allocated to make sure they're getting where they need to go um, to support people coming back fully. But we, we can't make up uh, for time that has been lost in the way that we would ordinarily expect we should. Thank you, Senator Atkins. And I, I think that goes to one of your earlier statements about wanting to, in this budget, protect what we have and that there is money for these causes and these concerns that, that the entire state is aware of. And I, I wanna ask you, uh, Senator Atkins, on a related mention where you just brought it up, and that is the broadband, the uh, challenge for uh, digital equity, so to speak, the digital divide. As you pointed out, we have become more reliant on broad the need for consistent, reliable broadband, both not only for work, but healthcare and also education. Uh, what steps or what 
the steps would you take to try to ensure consistent, reliable broadband for all, including education? Well, uh, again, a crisis forced us to do something that might have taken the state many, many more years to do. And that is fast track the fact that we need to ensure access in our rural communities, in our inner cities, anywhere that there is a lack of ability to have access. And um, huge, incredible uh, thanks to the federal government for allocating billions of dollars to allow the state to jumpstart working with our partners in industry to deal with the middle mile, the last mile. We have uh, legislators uh, on the Senate side and the Assembly side working with the administration uh, put together so that we would work with industry and government to keep this going. Now, now that we have, hopefully we are moving really out of this particular crisis, we cannot lose focus because, uh, you know, this really kick-started the need for broadband in a bigger way, and I think we have to see this project through, and billions of dollars expended and put forward to be able to do this, so we need to stay focused on that. Thank you, Senator. Senator Jones, same question. Well, as many people here know, I'm a, I'm a pretty often critic of government programs and their failures uh, at different levels, and I'll just, uh, EDD comes to mind. Uh, Employment Development Department, but I will give the governor credit on this particular issue, the middle mile broadband, and I know there were several bills uh, last year, some of them I supported, some of them I didn't, but uh, they actually picked my uh, district to do one of the very first projects, and I had the opportunity to attend the press release with Antonio Villaraigosa and the governor's uh, tech uh, leaders and, and really roll this out uh, of the of the state implementing this program, hiring the contractors to put the fiber optics into the ground. They had the trucks there, uh, the leaders were there, and they're done already. I mean, and, and, and they, were, they were done, I think I went on vacation for a week and came back and they were like several miles of roadway that they had to bury this fiber optic cable into and they're done. And so I'm looking forward to the rural areas of my community uh, my district having better access to broadband, and I do think that this is a program that if, if they do it like this through the rest of the state, it will be a successful program. Thank you. So, Senator uh, Jones, do we know when we, or your, you might see results from that effort in your district? As far as uh, internet being turned on? And getting two people the services they need in That's a reliable, consistent fashion? I will follow up fashion. on that and oh. find out. <laughs> I, know the ca I know the cable's in the ground, so. I'll see when they're going to flip the switch. Can I, we should also thank, I mean, this was an effort underway with industry, um, and, and this really was a shot in the arm because a lot of work had started on this between the schools, school districts, uh, private sector, and so this was government coming along and joining the work. So work was underway. Things are happening. Uh, you know, it is being expanded, but again, the real proof is going to be, do we see it through to the end? Because 10 to 1, there will be money needed on the back end because everything gets more expensive as you go. But we need to be really invested in seeing it through. Thank you. And that just truly reflects the collaboration of, as you described, all of the entities that could make this happen in a week. Thank you. And all the preparation that it took to make that happen. Uh, this is also related to COVID, but it is health care. Um, and uh, this is uh, your question, Senator Atkins, as well as yours, uh, Senator Jones. So we know that a combination of government uh, policy changes at the state and federal level have dramatically helped Californians obtain some type of health care coverage. Still, though, we believe there's approximately 2.8 million people in California uh, who, that is 7% of our population, that are still currently uninsured. And we know this number is expected to increase, we believe, because Medi-Cal, after pausing eligibility determinations for COVID, will resume eligibility determination. So this is the question. How can California best build on prior year's progress to close the health coverage gap? Well, um, you know, and I'm mindful as I look right at the former Secretary of Health um, <laughs> that I got to get this right. Uh, I do want to say, um, 
I am very proud. Uh, as I came into office, the Affordable Care Act was just getting started, and California was at the forefront. I believe health care should be a right. Uh, it is complicated, and you have to figure out how to pull it together. I am very proud of the work that we have done to implement the Affordable Care Act. I'm very proud of Covered California and the focus to not only make sure that there are options, and many of you out there, there's, I, I can't see this whole row because of the lights, but I know that there are people out here who've been our partners in the health plans to figure out uh, options uh, for communities up and down our state. And we both are in San Diego, so you know we follow the health plans that are available in San Diego. But during uh, this last several years, the thing I feel even better about is the ability to help um, support and subsidize middle income families who are part of Covered California to be able to afford uh, those uh, premiums. And so we wanna build on that. Uh, obviously, it's gonna be harder um, as we look at our fiscal situation right now. But if you look, California has done better than any other state in the country to cover um, our um, residents and even extend to undocumented who are also here working in our state, contributing to our economy. We have worked very slowly and methodically to try to cover everyone so that there is some access. Is it perfect? No. Do we, do we reimburse at a rate that we should? No. Uh, all of those things are still issues and challenges for us to tackle, but I do think we have to look at how far we've come, what we have been able to do, and the coverage in this state. We have 39 plus million people, and uh, a third of them on uh, Medicaid, Medi-Cal, and so what we do on the private side with Covered California and how we continue to try to provide subsidies and help folks is important. So I'm proud of what we've done. I know there are still challenges, um, but we're gonna continue to focus on that. Thank you, Senator Atkins. Senator Jones? Uh, I, I agree on the reimbursement rates. We obviously are gonna need to have robust conversations about that this year and uh, get the medical industry you know, on par with, with where they should be financially. We also need to look at the supply of doctors and nurses in California. Uh, my understanding that there's a uh, artificial constraint on nursing licenses in California that we need to take a, you know, why is that? Why are many of our young people graduating from high school in California and going and seeking nursing degrees in other states uh, and then staying there uh, to become a nurse or nurse practitioner or phys physician's assistant or doctor? And so we need to look at that as a on the supply side of the medical uh, industry. Uh, I don't, I'm not on the health committee. I'm not on the budget uh, committee either for health. So I'm going to rely on my uh, caucus members that are on those committees to bring these robust discussions uh, to those committees and then share with the rest of the caucus on how we can support them and move forward. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Jones, this is uh, first to you uh, about inflation. Uh, it's been on the news and on all of our minds for several months now. And although inflation has slowed in recent months, high consumer prices remain, including for items like gas and other necessities. And so the question is, what steps should state policymakers be taking to address this inflationary challenge? Well, you know, the bottom line of inflation is too many dollars chasing too few goods. Um, and, you know, one of the first things that we can help out, one of the proposals that I have is lowering the gas tax on fuel in California by a dollar per gallon. And if we lower the price of gasoline, that helps families move those 10, 20, 30, 40 dollars a week into other uh, things that they need to spend money on, food, health care, uh, and other items that, and that's a bipartisan or nonpartisan issue. Uh, President Biden has supported suspending the gas tax. Several states with Democratic governors and leadership have suspended their gas tax. So that's one way. You know, and I don't think any of us should be surprised by the inflationary position that we're in now. When the federal government prints uh, money at the level that it has been over the last three years, and I will admit that it started with the Trump administration. Biden doesn't get all the, the, the blame in my mind for the inflation position that we're in now. It actually started 
uh, under the Trump administration. So when the federal government is printing money as at the rate that it was, that it's cyclical. That's always what follows is inflation. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Jones. Senator Atkins, same question. Well, I, I think it's part of our fiscal outlook that we need to be mindful of. We, uh, my Democratic caucus had uh, a little bit of an overview from our legislative analysts this week in terms of what we should be concerned about and how we should approach it. Um, and that ties into, um, you know, what we need to do uh, around the budget and, and certainly being mindful of that and fiscally uh, prudent in how we use our resources. But, you know, California, um, the one thing I would say, while we need to keep mindful of all that, we are the fourth largest economy in the world. We uh, have seen fluctuations and changes in terms of venture capital, all kinds of things that are economic indicators. So we, we need to continually uh, look at that. We tend to do better than the rest of the country, but we also have higher costs. And that gets into a million other questions that all of you may bring up. Energy, how, how are we gonna have enough uh, energy uh, issues around water, natural gas, all those things. Um, and because my uh, colleague brought it up, I, I just have to comment on this. Um, and, and it's one of the areas where we will continue to debate. I actually uh, do believe it's very frustrating to see the cost of goods, the cost of gas, uh, gasoline prices rise. I do think we have to, everyone is frustrated about that. The governor is frustrated. Uh, my neighbor is frustrated. Uh, we are all frustrated about the cost of gasoline. I think it is really incumbent upon us to try to, through transparency, look and see. We know what we are charging as a state for taxes to do things related to our climate goals, related to our road repair, our bridges, and, and those, it, those infrastructure things that need to be repaired. And if I thought that, uh, if I really knew 100% that those dollars would really flow back to consumers if we undid the gasoline tax, I might entertain that conversation, but we do not know that. And, um, and what I do know is in light of recent situations with flooding and the damage done to our roadways, taking that money away and not fixing our roads uh, is a problem. So I know how much I am responsible for and the voters supported uh, you know, continuing the proposition and the gas tax because I believe people do want those repairs done. They just wanna make sure that's where the money is going and that government is not taking that money and putting it somewhere else. So the money needs to go to the infrastructure and we need to know how much of this is our uh, fees and, and, and costs to do that. But we also need to know what, uh, what, what more goes into that. I, and you know, there's a discussion to come, but when I see some major oil companies' uh, profits uh, as high as they are, more than $37 billion for some companies, you have to wonder about those profits. And that's not just gasoline, that's natural gas. That translates into cost, not just in the, at the gas pump, but in our homes if we uh, have natural gas. So I do think it's important to have some transparency around that. And then we know, let's start with, I mean, we're at PPIC, okay? Data is their platform. Let's have the data, and then we can have a reasonable discussion about what we should do and, and how we should do it in government. Thank you, Senator Atkins. We at PPIC certainly support that. Thank you. <laughs> this may be my last question before we go to audience Q&A, so I'm going to ask you, Senator Atkins, first, and this is about crime rates in California. We know that um, crime rates have fluctuated substantially since the pandemic, and yet uh, there's information that there's been a notable increase in certain offenses, uh, such as gun-related homicides, and very tragically, as we have seen most recently in Monterey Park and Half Moon Bay. Um, there's also been uh, an uptick reported in some aggravated assaults. And two-thirds of Californians say that violence and street crime are a problem where they live. So the question is, what can the legislature do to promote or ensure public safety and help to counter any increases in violent crime? Thank you. Um, well, I do um, 
very much believe that California has led the way in terms of regulations and uh, restrictions around guns. But uh, it has not resulted in a reduction in, in some of the ways that we would hope. I think some of this work has got to be done nationally and federally. Um, and um, it, it, it's just important to acknowledge that. But I also think we have to find better ways. We've come through some hard years. We have to find better ways to support uh, working as community with law enforcement. Um, and I do think we talk about the shortage of workforce as it relates to teachers, to nurses, to doctors, healthcare, many industries. You know, we are losing public safety officers too. And that's because the dialogue that we need to have uh, throughout our state and, and in this country is how does community work with law enforcement uh, to reduce crime in every neighborhood. Part of it is education, part of it is training, and part of it is uh, really um, recognizing that as a culture, I mean, you know, the United States has more gun violence than any other uh, nation in the world. So there's culture change and, and uh, that needs to go into this in addition. But, you know, I, I'm proud of what California has done to regulate the use of guns, uh, particularly um, assault, you know, assault rifles and, and um, the types of, of guns that, you know, regular people just don't need. Uh, and you certainly don't hunt. Well, maybe you do. I don't know, Brian. You'll have to tell me. Uh, <laughs> but my brother is a hunter, and he lives in Vermont. My family grew up with hunting guns, and no one in my family owns an assault rifle. Uh, so... I think there are places we can start and agree, but I think people are really, really everyday regular people. Gun owners, non-gun owners are frustrated with the level of violence. So it's more than just about the gun. It's about culture and how we uh, really work within our communities. And then we do also need to support, um, we do also need to support law enforcement. Thank you, Senator Atkins. And I know we'll get to Q&A in just a moment, but we'd like to hear from you, Senator Jones, on the same question. Well, I actually agree with, with a lot of what uh, Tony shared. And I think it comes down to, not just in California, but across the country, we really have a mental health crisis uh, going on. Uh, and we really are gonna have to have some tough decisions on criminal justice reform, specifically in California over this next uh, couple of years. I'm encouraged that uh, Assemblymember Merit Suchi is carrying a bill to reform a portion of Prop 47 uh, that decreased uh, theft uh, sentencing. So hopefully we can start addressing the smash and grabs and the low level thefts in California, which will also help us address a, a, an element of the homeless uh, situation as well. And so, We've got a lot of work to do. Um, I'm looking forward, again, to very robust conversations as we normally have in committee and on the floor in the Senate. I think the example, I, I rarely use uh, Washington, D.C. as the example, and I will share with you that as uh, California Senate Republicans, uh, we're going to focus on California. We're going to come up with solutions for Californians. We're going to avoid uh, the national conversations that are going on in D.C. and the 24-hour news cycle and everything that gets everybody uh, wound up, uh, you know, in the ideological bubbles. But uh, one thing that D.C. did do well in the last year is the bipartisan efforts on uh, the Safer Communities Act. Uh, when a couple of Republican senators and a couple of Democratic senators sat down together and said, hey, we need to come up with some reforms that uh, not everybody's gonna like on either side, but not everybody's gonna hate on either side. And I think that that particular piece of legislation that they passed through the House and the uh, Senate that President Biden signed was a, good, was a good piece of legislation, but more importantly, it showed that Democrats and Republicans can work together to come up with common sense solutions that will actually work. Thank you very much, Senator Jones, and thank you for these questions from me. Now we turn to the audience for uh, participation for Q&A, and we have some great PPIC folks here who have a microphone, so please raise your hand, and we will get the microphone to you, and when you get your microphone, please state your name 
and your organization, if applicable, for your question. And we so were told please. only easy questions, is what we were told. So here we go. Let's see on the left. I have to see a hand raised. Here we go. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Greg Fishman. I'm with Sacramento Regional Transit. My question is um, related to the governor's proposed budget, which makes some significant reductions in uh, support for local transit agencies at a time when many local governments and local planning agencies are trying to use more regional transit or foster regional transit to reach greenhouse gas goals. And I'm wondering if you could comment on that in general and the likelihood or the chances that some of those cuts might be restored. Please, Senator, Senator Ack. Um, well, you know, th this is the governor's proposal. Uh, this is a part of the process and now our budget committees and subcommittees will look at it. Clearly, there, uh, you know, there is a need to invest in public transportation and transit. In addition to the work we do to, to fix our roads, uh, there's certainly uh, been a reaction from a number of uh, stakeholders and senators. Uh, I can't speak for the assembly. Brian and I are hearing from our senators, so it will be part of a robust discussion in terms of how to address that issue. And obviously. Uh, a number of our colleagues really think it's important that we try to find a way to, to put some of that money back. So it will be part of our budget discussion. And so I appreciate, I know we're gonna hear a lot more from folks as we get underway in the budget subcommittee process. Senator Jones, do you wish to comment? Yeah, just real briefly, uh, you know, Tony and I served together on MTS in San Diego. So we've been through these conversations before. There's actually times on that board where uh, MTS had to make cuts in service to routes in my district that I had to come to the hard decision to support those cuts because they just weren't routes that were being used. So I, I think as part of that robust conversation, we've got to look at where is public, where does public transportation make sense? Where does it not make sense? And we've got to make the hard choice of where it doesn't make sense to stop expanding public transportation into those areas and concentrate on where it does work and where it is fiscally responsible. Thank you, Senator. And for our online audience, uh, you have questions, please send an email to ppiceventquestions at gmail.com. Uh, any other questions? Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And uh, welcome, welcome, Tani, and to the Senators. Thank you so much for your engagement today. Carolyn Coleman with the League of California Cities. We all spend a lot of time talking about better ways to address homelessness in, in, our, in our beautiful state. And I, I'd love to get your perspectives on how all levels of government can work better together to address homelessness. Thank you. Senator Atkins. Uh, sure. Um, well, uh, both Brian and I served at the local level and uh, you know, so appreciate the work you do uh, in your everyday um, life. I, part of the reason I came to Sacramento was I wanted to work on housing and, and homelessness. And I am more frustrated, at, like many people, because I've seen it, it has gotten worse. We've put a lot of resources and money, more than $10 billion over a few years, and we want that money to go to communities. And when we served at the local level, I, you know, I know, uh, I don't know how you feel, Brian, but the cities pointed to the county, the county pointed to the cities, and so, and everybody blames, and, the, state. And everybody <laughs> blames the state. Well, that's just indicative of the fact that we all have skin in this game and we need to be working better together. And I think um, in terms of the accountability plans that um, the governor asked for, the legislature wants that too because there's nothing worse than saying we allocated $10 billion to homelessness and we go home and there are more tents and more people on the streets than there were before. And so I think it really is incumbent and, and I've talked to County Board of Supervisors, I've talked to city council members, they're working together. Plus, not just the, the counties and the cities, but the, uh, the or community organizations, the COCs as we call them. And so we spent a lot of time for a few years dividing up the dollars we could give to all three of those entities. And then it became, we need the three entities to come up with a plan of how you're going to really help on this, uh, this issue of homelessness. And it is complicated because it's housing, so it's shelter, it, it is units, it is uh, 
health services, behavioral health services, other services. And so, um, you know, we really need to see those accountability plans. And part of the work we're going to do in the Senate through our budget process is uh, accountability to look at the money we've expended and how, how it is being used. Um, it, is, it is one of the most frustrating things when you put money towards an issue and you're not seeing an improvement. But we've got to count on our cities, our counties, um, and the community organizations to work together. So I'm, I look forward to seeing the, the reports that people are starting to come out with in terms of how they're going to do it. And then the biggest issue that we are now faced with on the, on the um, mental health side is a lack of workforce. The money arrived right as we were noticing not enough workers to be able to do the case management. So that's a workforce issue that we need to be on, as Brian also mentioned earlier. Thank you, Senator Atkin. Senator Jones? You know, I, I, I think one of the things I'd like to share is it's frustrating as a policymaker uh, when you present an idea, and, and it happens to my Democratic colleagues, it happens to my Republican colleagues, we, we, we come forward with a solution, or a solution, we come forward with an idea on how to tackle a portion of homelessness. And then immediately there's a slew of organizations that come out in opposition, and their main argument is that's not the solution. And I answer back after having expressed frustration, uh, yes, you're right, it is not the solution. And in California, we have 170,000 homeless people in California. We have 30% of the nation's homeless and 12% of the nation's population. And when somebody says that's not the solution, you're right, it's not the solution. There's 120 legislators, 170,000 homeless people. We could have 170,000 good ideas and that's probably what we need to solve homelessness in California. And I hope that every single one of my 119 colleagues in the legislature would come forward with one good idea, and we pass them all to uh, start addressing the homelessness in California. It's such a big issue, and, and Tony alluded to a, a lot of it. Uh, you know, we've got, we've, we've got to look at the mental health aspect of it and the drug addiction aspect of it. That, truly makes up the majority of the homeless population today. And look, their services, the state has done a great job, the counties have done a great job, municipalities have done a job addressing the people that are down on their luck. The single mom with a kid living in her car. You know, that's still gonna happen and we're still gonna have those situations. But there's services available for those folks and they've learned how to take advantage of them and a lot of them have recovered and gotten off the streets. But we have a chronic problem with drug addiction and mental illness that we're gonna to have to tackle in a serious way over the next couple of years. And I'm, I'm really encouraged that I'm having very good dialogue with my Democratic colleagues in the hallways on some of the ideas that have been proposed and I think we're gonna be able to come up with some good solutions, or ideas this year. Thank you very much, Senator Jones. I believe also online, we have one question and then we have uh, Jennifer from Cal Chamber. So this comes from our online audience. This is from a viewer in Sacramento. Um, and they ask, uh, given the historical importance of the building, can you talk about the decision to authorize the demolition of the annex building when it, and not uh, preserving, protecting, and updating the building um, with less impact on Capitol Park? Okay. 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 So two things on that, uh, three things actually. Uh, when it first started getting discussed and I was in the assembly, uh, I supported the idea of, of remodeling the current building and, and making it work. I understand that it got too expensive, whatever. Uh, so, but the second thing is, Nina and I were just walking across the park and this might be good news for your viewer. They were actually replanting some of the trees that fell over uh, the cranes are out there, the shovels are out there, the workers are out there replanting some of the trees that, uh, that fell over in the park. And then I just recently learned as a minority leader, I guess I'm on the committee that is going to be overseeing this. So uh, you're, you're welcome. I probably shouldn't you're say welcome. that out loud. Maybe I shouldn't share you're that. You're welcome. Look, California is a big, important state, and nobody doubts that. And our Capitol building has to be functional. And if we can make the annex work, I would support that. If we can't make the annex work, then we've got to find a way 
uh, to get a building in there that is functional, not for us, but, and, but for our, the public first and our staff second. Uh, because those are the people that the building, it's for the Californians, it's for the public. It has to work, and so we need to get it to be functional. Thank you, Senator. Senator Atkins, and then one more question. I, I will just add to that, um, it's, it's for the public, but it's also for the staff uh, that work in those buildings, and those of you that come to, um, to lobby or to make your point of view known. But I would just say, we looked at the cost of rehabilitating versus building new. And um, when you've got uh, issues within a building of asbestos, lead, uh, it, not accessible uh, for the people who work there or the public, there were accessibility issues, and we compared those costs, um, it was as expensive to rehabilitate an old building uh, as it was uh, to build new. Um, so that's a large part of it, and um, you know we're gonna continue to have discussions as this project moves forward. Thank you, Senator. Last question goes to the Cal Chamber. Thank you so much uh, to Tani of PPIC for holding this, Senator Atkins and Senator Jones. Thank you so much for your commentary. I'm just gonna ask an easy question for you uh, as we end this. But both of you have mentioned, um, obviously, housing as a priority. And I think, you know, uh, certainly in the business community, we see the impact in so many different areas. Uh, certainly with the workforce, um, it's hard for us to attract people to California to have them work in California when they can't find housing that's affordable, um, and it's a, a key issue for a lot, of our, a lot of our member companies. So you mentioned that it's a priority. I think that's great that it's a priority. I think it, obviously we know it should be a priority uh, for California. And there's been a lot of bills that I would say have tried different little tweaks or approaches. I'm gonna suggest is there a broader, more bolder view that we may see in housing this year? Um, and dare I say, CEQA and uh, review uh, and analyze whether or not that is working as we intended it to, or maybe it's time to review it and change it, not throw it out. Certainly we know it's uh, important to have environmental review and impact assessments as well. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Atkins. Well, I, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. Uh, you know, the biggest reform that we can pass in California is CEQA reform for housing. And we've, look, we do CEQA exemptions for sports stadiums uh, and billionaires. Why don't we do, CEQ, why don't we reform CEQA for everyday Californians to have a place to live? And we need to encourage cities to streamline their permitting process, uh, look at their permitting fees, and if they can lower them, lower them, if they can get rid of them, get rid of them. We did that when I was on the city council in Santee. Uh, we got rid of a lot of the, uh, just streamlined the whole per permitting process uh, to make it more efficient uh, to get homes built. And I think that's where we are in California. Um, I, you know, there, I don't know that there's one bill, Jennifer, because, you know, we, we've worked on housing legislation for years, and I had one group saying it's all about uh, bureaucracy, red tape, and streamlining, and the other saying it's money. And I had to say, it's both. It's all of those things. It's all of the above. But if you look at the legislation that we have passed, and every single one of these bills is hard to get done. You have to get votes in two houses and get it to the governor. And I have suffered defeat again and again on various pieces of legislation. But we've got, um, we've got a number of streamlining bills and politically speaking, it may be the only way we're able to get legislation done is bite-sized pieces. SB7 was a streamlining bill, uh, a, a redo of, and I know you know all these bills, everybody else doesn't, but uh, AB900, which was a streamlining project for bigger projects to, to have a process go faster for big projects. SB7 lowered the threshold, SB35, there was streamlining in, in Wiener's, uh, Senator Weiner's bill around that. Um, SB6, uh, AB 2011, I mean, there's been a ton of housing bills, uh, ADU legislation, accessory dwelling units, uh, my uh, duplex bill, SB9, that the League of Cities loves so much. Uh, I say with great love and affection in my heart. Uh, <laughs> You know, all of these things are attempts to find ways to produce housing. And as it relates to CEQA, I would just say, and I've heard the accusations again and again, it's like, well, the environmentalists use this to kill projects. The labor uses this to kill projects. But you know, let me remind you, there are communities attached to a lot of these issues, and they're not, they wouldn't call themselves 
A or B, labor or environmentalists. They are community members. I've been to so many community planning committee meetings in my life. There are communities who are very concerned and they seek what is very real to them because it's about the quality of their neighborhood, how their, how their neighborhoods grow. And so uh, CEQA is a tough one to evaluate if you're not gonna do it comprehensively. And I will just tell you, as hard as any one of those single bills was to get done, um, taking CEQA as a whole and looking at it, um, I think it's just really hard because there are too many stakeholders from too many different perspectives and you cannot blame just one group because you saw what happened with Berkeley and CEQA was used and the legislature had to do a piece of legislation in order to say CEQA was, we said, and the courts had to interpret, we said that CEQA was never meant to, to talk about enrollment numbers. So you see where these conversations go. And so I think um, I wanna continue to work on housing production because it is critical in all the ways that you have said. And we are gonna continue to do that. And you know, it's just the toughest uh, stuff to do, but we have to do it if we wanna help our economy, um, if we wanna provide homes for our kids so they don't leave and not come back. Um, so it's tough and I commit to you, I'm gonna continue to try to work on it but we're gonna to have to do it with all of the stakeholders and, uh, and not one group over another over another. I wish we had more time. Me too. <laughs> um, thank you, Jennifer, for that short little question on sequin housing. But we want to thank Senator Atkins and Senator Jones. Many thanks for your very thoughtful answers, and I think all of us walk away feeling California is in good hands with such knowledgeable answers and plans and robust debates in the future. Um, so on behalf of PPIC, thank you to the audience for attending our first in-person in three years. Thank you for being here and engaging. Please check us out on our website, and you'll be receiving a survey later about how this went and Please give us your honest feedback. We thank Cassandra Pye for her leading us off. Thanks to PPI staff for making this possible. Thank you, safe travels. Have a good day.